Hello, I'm Rebecca Wendland. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's a privilege to be here and to share some thoughts with you about our journey through life and God's mission for us together. I'm not sure if you'll recognize, if you can see the screen, if you recognize me, I'll turn around. Does that look any better? Maybe the clip? Our family was missionaries in Malawi, Africa for about 15 years. And my husband recently took a call back to the U.S. to be a pre professor at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon, Wisconsin. And while we were missionaries, we had this picture taken. It's surrounded by tea fields in an area called Mount Melange, beautiful area. But as you can see, it's more like the pace is a walk. We're not racing through life. Today I want to share some stories and challenges with you about what our life was like and also about God's calling in our lives. It's going to be from my point of view as a missionary, wife, and mother. Let me back up a little bit. I'd like to give you some background tidbits. I've been a Sunday school teacher, and while I was teaching, I had a ceiling fan fall on my head. I've been the only church organist and pianist. I walked in on a burglar breaking into our home, and I've also been in a boat on the water where my hair stood on end, and I probably was in an electrical field, could have been uh, struck by lightning, but God spared my life. This was all before the age of 15. That's when I realized God could use events in my life to make for some pretty entertaining stories, as well as God had a higher purpose. My dad is a retired Wells pastor. My mom is a retired x-ray tech, and she was with me today, traveled with me. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mom. And in case you had any questions about those tidbits, she can answer and field those questions because she was there. Uh, I, I'm a graduate of Northwestern Prep School and also Martin Luther College. I met my husband, who was also going to school to be a pastor. We married, had two children, and he was at his first call in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We were figuring out how to do ministry, be a parent, figure out how to put food on the table, get some rest, when he got a call to be a rural bush missionary in 2003 to Malawi, Africa. What to think. This is a picture of our family when we were in Milwaukee. And this is a picture of what it would look like if we transitioned to be village missionaries. I was nobody special. God didn't give me special gifts or abilities to know how to relocate a family around the world. What do we, what to think? I guess it brings us to the question, what is God's mission for us in life? You can read with me the words in yellow, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. That's the Great Commission, isn't it? And it is great, but it's not a personal mission statement, right? I mean, it would mean I would have to take God's word seriously and his goals and think about other people's spiritual needs quite seriously. I would have to leave my comfort zone. It would say I'd have to think hard about what God has to say about going into the world. God's salvation restores my relationship with God but it doesn't adjust a single priority. There are two lasting things in life. I'll give you a couple seconds. Can you think of what they are? The next slide suggests God's word and people. Those two things are going to last, but spreading God's word and making his will a priority aren't society's top goals. Nothing wrong with living a comfortable lifestyle, but it drive, if that drives my mission statement, it's going to be more like, I can't do all things. Not through him who gives me strength, because it might require sacrifice. And God could certainly use someone well more open to the possibility of spreading God's word. Isn't that what Jonah thought? Send someone else, Lord. In fact, I don't think it's so much what was inside the fish that day with Jonah. It was what was inside Jonah. God says in Ephesians 5, 2, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, 
and live a life of love, just as Christ loves us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Revelation 2.10 encourages us, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now these passages have mentioned going into the world, preaching, imitating God, sacrificing, being faithful to the point of death. Well, that's a pretty difficult ask, isn't it? I hear people say frequently, I could never do what you do. I could never go to Africa. And I like to say and whisper, yeah, me neither. Too many fears. Sometimes I feel God's calling is more like a mission impossible, a burden I'd rather not carry. Philippians 4.13, I put up there, says, I can't do all things through him who gives me strength. I know, there's a typo, but that fits way better with my thinking. I can't do it. I can't do all things because it's going to challenge my comfort zone, and frankly, I'm kind of comfortable right now. I don't know that I want to be inconvenienced. I can't do all things because it's going to challenge my priorities. I like the way things are. I can't do all things because change is going to mean sacrifice, and it might be that I run out of surplus, and it's going to hit pretty close to home. I can't do all things because change will put me off balance. It will be a strain on my schedule, my family. No, thank you. I can't do all things. Now, in Malawi, Africa, it's very common that ladies will carry things on the top of their heads. You can see the pictures, various things like fruits and vegetables, water. They might have their pots and pans, maybe a, an umbrella, a cow head, or a car battery. And when it's visible, I can see what they're carrying. But when it's in, in a container, I don't always know what's up there until they're bumped or they trip or they're caught off balance and things come spilling out. And so my question for you is, what are you filled up with? What comes spilling out when you're bumped or you trip in life? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. When things get hard, do those come spilling out? Or is it the opposite? We get bumped or tripped and all of a sudden it's anger and criticism and um, being upset and envious and not very pretty things come spilling out. The fall of Adam and Eve showed just how discontent they were with what God freely gives. Often what God offers in his word doesn't seem to be enough for me either. I had an international friend ask me once, how come Americans think that they should always be happy and get what they want? I thought, good question. Sometimes the worst thing God can give us is what we want. That reveals, I am not perfect. For sure, I can't do all things. The Lord reminds us in the word of the psalmist, you can read it with me, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. This calling of ours, this mission in life, it's personal for each one of us. It's a gift. God works through you. He works through me. God could have used angels, but instead he sometimes chooses to hide himself and work through our actions. Our path might not be easy. It might not be one we'd pick from 100,000 choices, but when it's in line with God's will, it's part of his eternal plan. I want to share a quote from Professor Mark Paustian. It's not on the screen, but he's quoting from his paper called Unleashing Our Calling. He writes, When a person's calling is not the one they would have chosen, and in fact, they might be unhappy there, it's not evidence of missing a calling, or changing circumstance, but it's here that our daily self is disciplined through the loving mind of Christ. We grow up in Christ. I can think of some Bible examples, someone like a Moses, but it also hits closer to home. We can understand God is not so much focusing on us being so very happy as much as us being in heaven with him someday. I've heard it said, if what you do isn't in line with God's word, it's a colossal waste of time. 
It seemed God's will for my husband was to go around the world and share the sweet message of salvation to hungry souls in a different land around the world. I wasn't sure I could do that, but it wasn't about me. It's not about who I am, but whose I am. It's about Jesus and his grace. My God is bigger than my abilities and my doubts and my problems because he gave me my abilities and who I am. He's bigger than my fears. He left heaven to earth to come to save us. Perhaps I could leave Wisconsin. I know God is faithful. He keeps his promises 100%, and I had to trust him in order to say yes to his plan for my life. So why do we worry when we know God's got this? He promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Putting my life in his care gave me peace as we had to say goodbye. Some pictures show it was very difficult. You probably spotted the error in the passage. I can't do all things. It's got an extra T. It's a compromise passage. If I compromise my life, I compromise my witness. I'm going to take off that T. I'm going to actually add another T and make a new word with the T's called trust. If I trust in God, why then I can do all things through him who gives me strength. My mission in life boils down to trusting God 100%. Like kids in school who often have excellent support at home and they just thrive, that's us. We have the God of the universe who has unlimited resources to help us. I know I can be faithful because he will give me support. Service to others is why we're here. What does that look like in your life? big or small. For me, it was to support a husband who was ready to go around the world. His mission calling was to go to the country of Malawi, Africa, to share the good news to the ends of the earth. And here's the country of Malawi around the world on a mission. We left for Africa in 2003. And I want to ask, do you think that's a long time ago? I think a great way to reflect on time is a time capsule. So I put together some statistics from 2003. And back then, gas was $1.38 a gallon. I used a film camera, a 35 millimeter, and packed lots of film. Going to take a lot of pictures in Africa. There was no Facebook. I packed VH VHS tapes for the kids still rented DVDs from Blockbuster before we left. I knew one person with a cell phone, my sister in college. Only pilots had GPSs. There was no Siri. And the final flight of the Concord jet took place. Now, sometimes we don't like change. And technology alone, so much has changed. Sometimes I feel like a brontosaurus just chewing on green leaves as technology zooms ahead. And we didn't take the Concord jet. But after three days and three flights later, they welcomed us in Malawi. The sign is even in English just for us. Welcome to Malawi. There's a picture of airport doors, and I put a little red arrow. A creative way to lock airport doors was handcuffs. In 2003, when we arrived, there was a famine. We were told that some children were eating only one meal a day. A friend in the village would hear little kids crying at night and thought they probably weren't going to be fed. The annual income per person was about $150 a year. Break that down, it's about 42 cents a day to feed families that were often eight to 10. Maybe you have eight kids plus the mom and the dad. That's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. The life expectancy was under 40 which means some of us here today wouldn't be here today, including me. We lived in the southern city of Blantyre, Malawi. Malawi is one of the least developed countries in the world, often the poorest non-warring country in the world. And in the picture, you can see there's a little boy with a blue baggie trying to pick up grain kernels that had fallen from my husband's truck. He was more worried about what he was going to eat for a meal that day than he was going to school. The passage says, go into all the world and preach the good news of all creation. That meant many living changes for us. 
So what's daily life like in Malawi? Well, there are many blessings and many challenges, just like life anywhere. But the contrast from daily living here to there is significant. In many ways, it is very hard living in, for Malawians and in Malawi. You can see they carry a lot of heavy loads and a lot of burdens living a subsistence life. We had lots to learn. They have a different language, say Murimanji and Dilibuino Kainu. Hello, how are you? A different currency, the Kwacha. They drive on the other side of the road and they use the metric system. We learned to live during a very hot, dry, dusty time of year and a very wet, rainy, moldy time of year and learn to live quite simply. Our first house was in a place called Nyambadwe. You can see it's heavily burglar barred, but we were thankful for a secure mission house to stay and next had to figure out what to eat. Shopping was and remained a very challenging task for me. I was accustomed to getting flyers in the mail and clipping coupons and figuring out what to make. And there, if you went to the market, you see their wares, you pick something out, try and barter for it, pay in Chichewa, speak, uh, pay in Kwacha, speak Chichewa, and figure out if it looked good, what I could make a meal around those ingredients. So how big is your wallet? Don't show me, I'm not, not interested in looking at it, but picture it in your mind. You might think, why do you ask? Well, the currency is the Kwacha. When we moved there in 2003, it was one US dollar to 120 Malawi Kwacha. In 2017, when we left it, it had devaluated to about 750 Kwacha to one US dollar. So to try and do the mental math, 33,900 Kwacha would be under $50. To keep calculating was tricky, but the more difficult part was their biggest bill for a while was the 500 kwacha, then the 1,000 kwacha, and in 2016 we got the 2,000 kwacha and it was worth $3. So the biggest bill was $3. So when my husband would take some U.S. currency, the dollar, and exchange it, he would come home with stacks of cash, and our wallets weren't that big. He actually had to take briefcases. So if you wanted to buy an airplane ticket, you needed to pay with stacks of cash. Checking out at the checkout counter was tedious, as so you had to count basically in multiples of three. But hey, I was a millionaire in Kwacha. <laughs> Shopping was tedious and sometimes after I would take so much effort to go to the market or go to the store and buy things, I would come home with about half of what I expected to uh, buy and realize sometimes the items weren't always that great. More than once, I'd come home with something and it was sealed with bugs. I repeatedly went to the store and bought home, uh, rolls, whole wheat rolls, got home, cut them open and found bug parts. One time I had a particularly good specimen of a bug part and thought, I'll go back to the store. Maybe the manager would like to see they're having bugs baked in their rolls. So I went to the store, asked to see the manager. He came and I said, sir, I think you'd like to see what is being baked in your rolls. Look at this bug. He shrugged his shoulders and said, we have to use up the flour. That's when I thought I will start making my own homemade rolls. Oatmeal frequently had weevils in it, but when it was on the shelves of the store, we stocked up because you never know when it was going to come again. I heard a bag of flour once in the pantry from the next room, and that's when I realized you have to freeze all dried goods. At least that way the bugs are dead. And if you're going to have oatmeal, you pour in some liquid, give it a stir. The dead bugs usually float to the top and can be discreetly scooped off. The kids sometimes suspected they had bug parts in their food, but they rarely complained, and at least they were dead. There were many times when I was hungry for certain foods, like lasagna, ham, peach pie, chips and salsa, apple turnovers. What I realized was the best thing was make it from scratch. But that's only if you could even find the ingredients. Uh, Christmas ham would set us back $80. So things could be costly. A pan of lasagna could be $25, and that was if I could find the imported cheese. 
On one occasion when I had an Italian craving, my mom and Hannah helped me with a kit make some cheese from scratch. It was wonderful. We were very proud of our cheese making, but it took so much work. Over time, I learned I could probably wait two more years until the next furlough to satisfy my Italian cravings, save myself a whole lot of work and a lot of money. Now, if you go to Super Walmart and you walk down the cheese aisle, I look at the sliced and the shredded and the cubed and the cheddar and the mozzarella and the gouda and the pepper, pepper jack and the parmesan. I go to the checkout. I use a credit card. They speak English. It feels like cheating. Making meals could have been much, much simpler if we would have just eaten the local foods at the markets. They were more readily available and they weren't that expensive. But I forgot to mention, they do have fast food and it's often right by the side of the road. That is if you'd like to eat mice on a stick. I don't know, maybe it tastes like chicken? Other shopping options could be you could find fish being transported on their vehicles or on one occasion we saw this goat hanging right by a bicycle shop so if you had a puncture you could get your bike fixed while you pick out your side of goat maybe a side of flies and dust with that very convenient shopping this gentleman on his bike had some chickens you could buy bananas and gourds and go to the market and the prices were generally a lot lot cheaper I tended to opt to shop at local import stores. They would keep their meats in coolers. They would have shelves of canned goods, produce. It was more expensive because you didn't barter. They often spoke English, but sometimes it was more reliable. One time I was shopping at a little import store, went to the cooler section and thought, I gotta go back and get my camera. They had on their cooler ox kidney, ox liver, bones sawdust, fats, pet food, and leg of goat. And I didn't exactly know how to make a meal around of some of those things. The typical diet in Malawi is nsima. It's pounded boiled field corn. And it takes months of growing the crops, the planting, growing the rains, harvesting, and it is certainly not fast food. They'll often say if they don't eat in Sima at a meal, they haven't eaten all day. And I guess I haven't eaten for years. The next picture is a picture of a typical meal. And this is one they would serve my husband if he went to the villages to do a worship service. Can you see there's something missing in the picture? Not burgers and fries, vegetables. It is not manly to eat vegetables. So if they were serving my husband, they would serve a lot of encima or a lot of rice. They would give protein. If it was a celebration and they could afford it, it might be chicken or beef or guinea fowl or goat, maybe a boiled egg in an oily tomato sauce. But vegetables weren't something to make them feel important. Vegetables they do eat could be pumpkin leaves, okra, cabbage, onions, tomatoes, um, but the men generally didn't want to eat the vegetables on a special occasion. I was taught to always clean my plate. There, if you clean your plate, it means they have insulted you. They did not give you enough to eat. So they will give you a quart of nsema patties or a quart of rice, a lot of food. So if you can't finish it, that's what they expect. And that food plate will go to waiting hungry children who will then eat the rest of what you couldn't finish. Now, ladies, Ladies know the importance of vegetables. We had women who would come to our gate called the Mai Msamba, vegetable women. They would come and spread their wares, and they only spoke to Chewa. They only wanted to barter with me in Kwacha, but it was right at my house, and so I could pick out the different produce that I thought I might like to make a meal around. But I had to be careful. Their wares were organic, and their organic meant blemishes, bugs, and worms. If I wasn't careful, those heads of broccoli had countless worms. I'd maybe think I'll make a soup. I'd put it in a pot, start boiling it, and the bugs would come floating to the top. I could discreetly scoop it out, except it was rather tedious once the pepper had been added. It got mixed in. I was told new people in Africa see bugs in food, look at it and go, mm, throw out the food. 
After you've been there a while, you realize bugs are going to be a part of food. Pick out the bugs, eat the food. Seasoned veterans in Africa are going to say, bugs are just extra protein. Eat the food, enjoy the uh, bugs, and it's all part of the experience. To me, seasoning is still salt and pepper. You can see our daughter Hannah really enjoyed watching the vegetable women and actually tried to sell me back some of their produce as a fun way to play. On the topic of bugs, here are some of the ones that we encountered. There was a big tarantula in our house, the one pictured up there, and my daughter said, Mom, that one even cast a shadow. You can see that's a rather large spider. My husband killed that one, took care of it before I woke up that morning. The next picture is a picture of a very large golden orb. It spins a beautiful golden web. Each strand is as strong as Kevlar, but my mom was coming to visit. She does not care for spiders, so my husband was relocating that one off the property. We had giant centipedes, which had a very poisonous bite, uh, different snakes, water scorpions, all on our property. The next slide shows much more personal encounters. There's a picture of a bush. I put a little green, uh, red arrow next to a green snake. I never saw it. I pulled up in a vehicle to our house, got out to open the gate, came back, and my daughter, who was in her car seat, could have, if her window was open, could have reached out and touched it. It was a boom slang, very dangerous snake, but they're thankfully quite shy. I couldn't even see it until it moved, but it has big eyes, and there it was, right in the bush by our house. The next one, we had many rat encounters, and so we'd try and set traps and take care of them. The scorpion with the babies on its back, I had in my hand. I was relocating a brick in the yard, picked it up, saw the scorpion with about 13 babies on its back and thought, I should really smash this. Then I thought, no, put it in better lighting and get a picture. Then I can show you guys what I saw. And the last one is a solifuge. This one was running like the wind in my husband's office. He was also running like the wind out of his office because the jaws on that are massive. In Chichewa, it's called the Kuchotse Mfumu, which means even the chief gets up. You're all sitting today like chiefs, and all the visitors stand. But if that thing comes running in the room, the Kuchotse Mfumu means even the chief gets up. He doesn't want to be bitten by that either. Then again, our kids love the harmless bugs. This is a picture of many of the different ones that they loved playing with day in and day out. Amazing creatures like a chungalolo, giant snails, Chameleon, python, that one was at a farm, hedgehog, dung beetle, lizards, geckos. They found them in the yard and were very fascinating, fun daily pets. But it was the small bugs that I did not find so fascinating. The termites were everywhere. They were so prevalent, people would just find the plant crops on their termite mounds. They shed their wings, so the bottom picture on the left is steps of termite wings. Have to sweep that up in the morning. They would make tunnels coming through the floor overnight, but they were really good source of protein. So a lot of times they'd be collected by the hundreds, thousands, fried up and sold as street food. I don't think those tasted like chicken, <laughs> but they were a good source of protein. Ants were very difficult to keep out of the kitchen. Um, and the sugar. Killer bees came around now and then. Katydids, we might find them under a door handle in a cup on our toothbrush. We had stick tight fleas that plagued our chickens. They would jump, bite, and wouldn't let go. But the most tricky on that slide is the bed bug. Literally, it came from a person who had come to our house from the village. Once we had them in our house, they were literally a nightmare to get rid of. But the bugs in the health arena were taken the most seriously. If it's a bad year here with mosquitoes, it's just an itchy bite. There, if it's a bad year, you don't know. Is it malaria? Did you get bitten and it's a fever and you may have a serious health trouble? We slept under bed nets every night. If we went in a high malaria area, we would take a prophylaxis. We took many measures, but my husband did contract malaria on one occasion, and when his fever got to 106, we were starting to get concerned. Thankfully, a new medicine, Coerinate, um, was given, and he had eventual healing, but it was kind of scary. 
I'm thankful the kids and I never did get malaria, but you never knew. Was that fever malaria or was it just a sickness? Security was another very big issue. I list a bunch of layers of security there, everything from walls, gates, razor wire, all the way down to God. We made every effort to control the controllables and left the rest to God. Our premises was quite secure. As a result, our doors and windows were heavily burglar barred, and we lived using fistfuls of keys to lock and unlock doors and grates. There it took me about 15 minutes in the evening to check every door, check every grate, make sure nothing was left out or it probably wouldn't be there in the morning. In the U.S., I timed it, takes me about 15 seconds. I want to add that Wells has been very mindful of our security measures, and they were very supportive of implementing anything we needed to make us feel secure, and that was very reassuring to know over the years. Americans are considered so wealthy. We were a target. We were blessed to have a mission house and vehicles and appliances and phones and electronics and more possessions than we could possibly need, and as a result, we were considered rich And with a Robin Hood type mentality, rich people should give to the poor. We weren't against giving to the poor, but when everybody's pretty poor, who do you give to? We would have children and members and beggars come to our gate frequently in English asking, give me money. You think, well, how do you set a determining factor to who to give money? We realized the national pastors who were pastoring the rural areas, had children, and they were struggling to get their children into schools and pay the school fees. So my husband's grandpa, E.H. Wentland, set up a scholarship fund to help fund the children of the national pastor's families, and we thought, that's a good channel to know that we're really helping people in need. But it was tricky, because everybody's poor. If they live a subsistence life, and the crops and the rains were poor that season, They were too. They would make their own bricks, which makes their huts, which might be smaller than your living room. They washed in rivers and lakes. Most of the time their possessions could fit in the back of one pickup truck. And how do you set a determining factor to who you can help when everybody is sometimes struggling? Our first home in Yimbadwe was located by a very busy walking path, and we were quite exposed to a lot of foot traffic. One time we had gone out of town, come back, and the next day we realized while we were gone, all three of our neighbors had been broken into. Their dogs were poisoned and they had been burglarized. Our house was spared, our dogs were spared, and we felt like God isn't just listed on part of our security. He is and remains to be the rock of why we can trust him and feel safe at night. We often had our alarms going off, and it wasn't our alarm, it might be a neighbor's alarm. So over time, the mission did move us to a safer location. Even still, we would have people climbing trees to look over our wall, throwing stones over our wall, or even removing sections of razor wire in the night. One of the most concerning security issues was when a massive truck lost control and smashed through our security wall one evening. The timing was pretty bad. Rob was gone. It was dusk. And when it's dusk, it means the police all go home. There is no police protection. Here, if you drive by a place and you see walls and razor wire and a guard tower, and uh, you kind of know it's a prison or a security area, and the criminals are all locked up. There, the criminals often aren't locked up. They're running around free, so each person has to build walls and razor wire and have guards and lights and security measures, and it really is a costlier measure for everyone. After years of living at Nyambadwe, we did relocate to Kabula Hill for safety reasons. It was closer to town, it was in a safer neighborhood, and we had a lot less trouble. One afternoon on a Sunday, the kids and I were gardening. I was showing them how to transplant a certain plant in the front yard, and we heard this rushing water. We didn't realize two thieves had jumped over the wall and the razor wire and had gotten to our backyard water faucet tap and had stolen the tap. We could, they were so close we could see what they were wearing, and they had a big duffel bag. They saw us, we startled them, and they went back over the wall. I think they probably were hoping to fill their duffel bag And that's when I realized I have to retrain my brain. I could panic. I could uh, 
not know what to do, but to retrain my brain says, the Lord's in control. Give it to him. I would have really not minded if he would have put an angel with a flaming sword by our front door. But then again, there were no shortage of our prayers going to heaven. We really needed to recognize he was going to keep us safe and in control no matter what. Those prayers kept ascending. We had no shortage, but we did have a shortage of many other things. Electricity. Sometimes the electricity would go out for five 10, 20 hours at a time. This was daily frustrating. We also had power surges. When the power would come back on, it would blow out light bulbs. And cleaning up glass by candlelight can be kind of frustrating. Anything plugged in at those times might blow. And when the power wasn't on, you couldn't do laundry, couldn't plug in your phones, couldn't charge anything, couldn't use the computer or internet. And a lot of times, I'd want to cook but our stove was electric. The kids would ask, Mom, what are we going to have to eat? I'd say, I don't know. It depends when the power comes back on. One time, as dusk was approaching, two of the kids said, Mom, we're getting really hungry. What's for supper? I said, I don't know. It depends if the electricity comes on. I said, you know, the sun, it hasn't set yet. Why don't you guys wash up? It's easier for children to use the bathroom without candles. So Caleb was quick on the draw, and he said, I'll shower first. So he went running in the bathroom, turned on the faucet, shower faucet, came running back and said, Mom, the shower water's hotter than I thought, because the first person who showers got the hottest water. He said, I think you could make supper with that. I thought, okay. So I grabbed one of my measuring cups, went in the bathroom, filled it up with warmish, hottish shower water, and thought, well, what could I make with that? I thought I got some noodles in the pantry, kind of like a ramen noodle called a numi noodle. I got a can of corn, and I had some bacon bits that I was saving from furlough. They were in the fridge, but I didn't want to just add them. I wanted them crispy. So I thought, well, what can I make them crispy with if I don't have um, the stove to cook with? So I started lighting candles because the sun was setting and saw I had a big four-wick red candle thought, that's emitting a fair amount of heat. So I put on an aluminum pie plate with, with the middle cut out, put another aluminum plate on top, and thought, I'll see if those will get hot on the candle. Sure enough, less than two minutes, those things were sizzling. Our house smelled amazing, and that soup was really wonderful. <laughs> now, electricity is nice, but water is a staple. You cannot live without water. Any water we would consume, I would boil 20 liters at a time and run it through a filter. We had storage tanks to fill up during times when the water was out, but even still, we ran dry on occasions. We would collect the rainwater, which you can see wasn't so very clean, from the downspout and occasionally went to the village pumps to collect some to bring home as well. I tried to only drink boiled filtered water over the years since I picked up some stomach bug that troubled me for years, which is why I really wasn't tempted by the mice on the stick very much. Speaking of pumps, we also had fuel shortages. I put a red arrow by a lock. Sometimes they even locked some of the uh, fuel areas just so that people couldn't steal it. You might wonder, why did I take a picture of the fuel gauge? Well. One time my husband had left for meetings, and I just had a feeling. I thought our fuel was being siphoned. So I took a picture, and you can see the fuel gauge is almost full. That was in the evening. The next morning, I got up at 5.30, went down with my camera, took a picture of the fuel gauge, and it was almost empty. I thought overnight someone had siphoned our fuel when my husband was away. So I went to the mechanic who put a bunch of clamps on so it wouldn't happen again, but we didn't have much fuel. And in 2009, the country completely ran out of fuel. They had a foreign exchange problem where uh, the foreign exchange, people didn't really want kwacha and weren't selling them fuel. So we did not have much fuel, but we heard on one occasion it was coming to a nearby town of Limbe. And Rob and I thought, we need to get fuel. So I said to Hannah, our oldest daughter, who was 10, you're in charge. <laughs> Make lunch for the kids, 
make supper for the kids, we'll try and be back after dark. So my husband and I went and um, drove to the nearby town of Limbe. It was gridlocked. We ended up spending eight hours inch by inch, moving forward, hoping to get fuel. We told people about our church and got to know everyone around us. And after eight hours, we were able to get fuel. We went home so happy and thankful that we had fuel that day, but it didn't always happen. Sometimes you'd wait in line for six, seven hours and they'd run out three cars ahead. And you had to think, well, now I have to have fuel to get back home and enough fuel to get to the next place if they have fuel. And it was really a struggle to figure out when you should try and wait in a fuel line and hope you might get fuel. That went on for quite a while. The Christmas of 2009 was kind of tricky because fuel cans were banned. Trucks then for um, the black market, they wanted to try and stop the siphoning to sell at the black market. Gas was about $8 a gallon, but you could sell it for maybe $25 on the black market. So trucks would be coming in, and they all of a sudden realized they weren't going to be able to get fuel, so their loads of perishable groceries would just rot at the border. So when we'd go to the store, the shelves would be empty, the coolers wouldn't have much in it. So as Christmas approached, a friend of mine and I decided we were going to do a circuit of seven different little stores, and we'd see if we could find the groceries that we wanted to do our Christmas baking. And we went to all the circuit, and I got about half of what I had hoped to get and was really happy I found butter. I thought, I can make an awful lot with butter. But when I went to go use it, it smelled rotten. You might think, how could you buy rotten butter? Well, this next slide explains volumes. Notice, apologies to our valued customers for a bad smell we're experiencing in our store. This is due to the decomposition of rats after being poisoned. Sorry for the inconvenience this may cause management. You never know what you are going to smell, and this truly is a third world problem. We had other outages as well. Phone line and inter internet, we were on dial-up for many, many years, and it never worked quite well. And when I realized that bird's nest was in our phone line box, I thought, well, clever bird, but no wonder our phone never works. It ended up being an unexpected blessing because our phone line didn't work often. I would write notes home. I wanted to keep my family up to date and took careful notes of what was going on. Those notes ended up being part of the book, Bloom Where God Plants You, that I published, and I would have never expected that to be a blessing that would come out of a very poor phone line. Sometimes eggs were scarce. One Easter, uh, we barely had any eggs to celebrate Easter with, which wasn't a big deal, but in years to come, we had our own chickens. I would buy flour, 50 kg at a time, and freeze it first, so that if flour was a shortage, at least I had a bunch in my freezer. Sugar. There's a sign there that says, Sugar Kulibe. I put a little red arrow, and two guards are standing underneath. You might think, well, that's kind of unusual. It was very unusual because Malawi is a sugar producer. The slide above shows a tractor that's carrying loads of sugar cane. They had endless hectares of sugar cane. It was a wonderful place to grow sugar, but they wanted the foreign currency. So they weren't selling the sugar to any of us living in Malawi. They didn't want the kwacha. So people were getting rather upset, and they put the guards there just to make sure there was no problem if people got upset that we couldn't buy sugar that was being grown. We also had milk that sometimes we would bring home. It was fresh milk. We'd open it, and it was already spoiled. The kids were pretty good sports, but every now and then they'd say, Mom, there's chunks in the milk again. It's kind of looking like cottage cheese, but hey, I had recipes for that. Driving is on the other side of the road. It's very unpredictable road conditions, and it took me about three months before I finally felt comfortable. It's stick shift, and the roads are rather challenging and unpredictable, like floods, huge potholes, the shoulders would be soft, you'd go over rickety bridges, and the driving could make it dangerous. On one occasion, I did mention to mom, you know, I see those rickety bridges and I just close my eyes when we go over. And she said, well, don't do that if you're driving. Rob didn't ever close his eyes when he drove to the villages. He often would 
uh, go during the rainy season and get stuck. One time he got stuck so badly in the mud that men had to nearly surround the truck, lift it up, put tree branches underneath so he could gain traction and get it free. He one time went through a riverbed that the river was over the hood of his truck and he had a snorkel to get air to the engine but the water never quite drained out of his one headlight. You can see mudder, muddy water remained in that for a very long time. The roads were often very crowded. They were full of traffic-like bikes carrying massive loads. Animals would be in the way, unpredictable minibuses, and even ox cart crossings. I have witnessed personally many accidents and took all of these pictures as we would drive by, and I've known people killed over the years. I was glad mostly when I could drive, but getting my Malawi driver's license was a very unpleasant experience. I'll leave it at that. We were thankful to be able to drive to our urban church, beautiful Savior, although during the fuel shortages, we actually would walk to church and save our fuel for trips to different places. But the kids and I regularly attended the English services at Beautiful Savior. We would attend Chichewa services occasionally with my husband, but it is such a blessing to worship in English, your native language. So I would teach Sunday school. Never had a ceiling fan fall on my head there because there weren't any. <laughs> I taught Bible groups, by ladies' Bible study. I did church crafts. I even shared stories at various orphanages, especially during the um, special times of the church year like Easter. During the fuel shortages, we sometimes would walk to church and birthday parties to save the fuel so our kids could get to school. It was much farther away and it was safer because our kids attended an international school. And at the international school, they used a British curriculum. They had standards instead of grades. All check marks on their work were good. So I kept telling the kids, when you get to America and they put check marks, it means it's wrong. They weren't sure if I was telling the truth, but I think they found out it is different here. They learned French there. They took swimming classes and rubbed shoulders with many different nationalities and religions. They wore uniforms for school for many different events and put on many productions. Amazingly, at Christmas time, they would open with Luke 2 and sing songs like Joy to the World and Silent Night. The weather was often very beautiful. It was a subtropical climate, and you can see a lot of very colorful birds and flowers. During the rainy season, it was so lush and green, but the drawback is when it's green outside, often it would be green inside, and our house would sometimes uh, have roof leaks and be damp. We had our fair share of leaks, and at one point I just cooked using an umbrella. The electricity was on, and I wanted to finish cooking. There was a roof leak, so I just popped the umbrella so I could finish cooking while the power still was on. You can see during floods, sometimes the houses would just crumble right back to mud. You might get a wet foot trying to check the mail. There, any stairs would turn into a little waterfall, and we even had a visit from a crab. In the hot season, when the temperatures got really hot, it was kind of stuffy trying to sleep because there was no air conditioning, and if the power was out, you didn't even have a fan. Sometimes we'd open a window hoping for a breeze, but if the breeze came, you knew it was bringing a lot of dust as well. So the dry, dusty season, if you went to sleep, say, in the villages, you might wake up and kind of have to dust yourself off. In the south, Rob conducted worship services sometimes where the temperature was ab above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it's summertime and you're worshiping in a church that has a metal roof, it is very hot. He would pick up the communion ware and it felt like it had been in a preheating oven. Much of Rob's ministry was in village congregations in the lower Shire, which was many hours away to the south. He would drive on questionable roads, had countless flat tires. But once he arrived, the ladies would be singing with such joy, happy that he had come. They would take anything and carry it to the church. They would give him food and offerings out of thankfulness. It was so humbling. They had so little, and yet they gave bountifully. 
It reminds me of our gifts to God. He doesn't need our gifts, but it's what it means in their hearts. We need to give out of the thankfulness, and they did too. During the fall harvest, Rob might return with a truck full of maize, corn, or sweet potatoes. And when I learned to turn sweet potatoes into sweet potato chips, it was like I had spun straw into gold. Even when the churches were just open, thatched roof buildings, or maybe they had been washed away by a flood, their benches were dirt, or if they just worshipped under a tree, the worship was so upbeat. The singing was just beautiful, and the choirs sang with all their heart. We recently worshipped for Easter. We worshipped in person, and our parking lot was full. Can you picture your full church parking lot? This is a picture of a parking lot where they had a full day of worship as well. Lots of bikes. It was a joy to share Jesus in any setting. Malawians are very friendly, and they hunger for the Word of God. It's called the warm heart of Africa, and their hearts beat with life from above, not knowing when their time will be up. They must know Christ before the end. He died for all. Now raise your hand if you think there's still witchcraft today. You're right. Can you picture what you think a witch doctor might look like? We were coming into town one time, and there were a cluster of bamboo poles with white flags on top, and my husband said, that's the medicine man, that's the witch doctor, he's come into town. We drove home, my husband put down his stuff, we unpacked the car, he put his wallet away, but he said, I'm going to grab the camera, and I'm going to go back. I want to get a picture of a witch doctor just to show people at presentations. And I thought, yeah, I've never seen a witch doctor either. What do you think they look like? Here's the picture he took. That's the witch doctor. He was actually very friendly. He wanted to show my husband all the snakes that he had. You can see they're actually crawling in his shirt. And he said, oh, these are very poisonous snakes, but they never bite me because of my powers. He showed my husband all of his potions and all the things that he uses for his witchcraft. And my husband took pictures and video and said, well, thank you, and was ready to leave. And the witch doctor looked at him and said, oh, no, you need to pay me now. My husband said, oh, I left my wallet at home. Not a great idea to support witch doctors. So my husband goes, well, I don't have any money. I can't pay you, kind of intentionally leaving his wallet at home. And the witch doctor said, if you don't come back and pay me soon, your camera's going to break. When my husband came home and told me that, I kind of got the shivers and thought, that's spooky. Who believes? That's a good question. I want to share a newspaper clipping from 2017 that's not that long ago that shows a story about a man and charms and a witch doctor. It's going to clearly illustrate the fact that the devil still has his grip. Sharing Jesus and working while it is day is as vital now as it ever has been. Here's the story. It's about a 22-year-old man, Limbali Salawatha. He died on Saturday after drinking charms to get rich. According to the dates of police, he got the charms, was advised that he would die for a week, and thereafter rise a rich man. The man took the concoction to his house, drunk it, after advising his wife not to cry or tell anyone, he ordered her to collect the maggots into a bag from his decomposing body, and then that would all turn into money when he resurrects after a week. Meanwhile, police are advising people to refrain from believing anything they hear, but should work hard if they want to get rich. There is a lot of spiritism and rituals and secret societies like the Gulewam Kulu, this big dance, and witchcraft that still exists in the people's lives today and around death and funerals. They don't want a dead person's spirit coming back to life. If you notice, there are layers and layers of cement over some of the graves. That's to hope that those dead people can't come back through that cement. And it's kind of expensive to do that. But they don't want to take a chance. They might bury someone with their sleeping mat or their walking cane just to make them happy. Pregnant women stay away from graveyards. They don't want the spirits affecting their babies at all. They need the peace that Jesus gives. His resurrection 
and his salvation, which means our eternal life. Sometimes in the remote churches, Rob was the only white person they ever saw. Some babies being baptized would cry because they thought he was a ghost because of his white skin. His ministry was important. Many of those babies would have charms around their necks that they had bought from the witch doctor because they thought it protected the babies from the evil spirits. They're afraid. They're afraid of the witch doctor. They're afraid of evil spirits, but it was with joy that my husband could share the beautiful news of Jesus and assure them that God is bigger than any of those charms around their neck. Rob would cut those charms off the baby's necks to assure parents and everyone that it's a visible way we don't need to hang on to the world or the devil's trappings. You can see there are some charms in the top picture. We have some on the display table. It was something they wanted to hold on to so tightly. And it seems pretty straightforward to take something and cut those charms off those babies' necks and say, you don't need to hang on to the, the world's trappings, except when it's my turn and I have to get cutting and I have to say goodbye to my culture and get cut and get cut from the ties of our family as some of the kids were going away to school, and to cut the ties of my culture and realize I shouldn't cling to those things above my trust in God, it's pretty hard to get snipping when it's me. The hardest ties to cut were family. This is a picture of our oldest daughter, Hannah, when she was heading around the world to go to school at Luther Prep School in Watertown, Wisconsin, which was eight time zones away. It wasn't easy. She went with countless prayers, and we were very thankful for the family stateside, including my mom and parents, hoping to help her in any way. But in the end, God could take even better care of her than we could. But it takes complete trust to let go. And go she did. She calculated in her 18 years of travel, she spent 1,680 hours of travel, 70 days in transit, 85 hours in flight. That was a lot of prayers as she went back and forth from Africa to America. Malawi is a world away. It's away from family, it's away from friends, and you're gutted of any fluff. Here's a picture that kind of represents what that might look like. Have you been there? Maybe empty, burned out, barely hanging on with a long, lonely road ahead? Or do you feel so low and cut off that you feel like a seed being pushed underground and covered with dirt and might turn moldy before you show signs of sprouting a new life? Moving, leaving family behind, saying goodbye, can all be painful and leave you feeling so empty. Saying goodbye after every furlough was so difficult. Saying goodbye to the kids as they began to leave for school in the USA was so heart-wrenching. But this world, it's not our destination. We're really in transit. We're in training. I want to share a thought from Martin Luther that I found uh, very meaningful. He says it's God's way to empty a man first and then to fill him up with his blessing. And this picture is from Victoria Falls in Zambia, and I like the picture. It's showing us, perhaps as the river below, how we're being drained and constantly pouring out and giving, but God's Holy Spirit is never stopping to pour in even more with the waterfall to fill us up. Every day we might be emptied of something, maybe even ourself. Struggles and failures, they're great teachers. God sometimes can allow things to be quite difficult because it makes us wrestle with him and God is glorified in the process. We can learn what's most important not by what we have and what we lose, but what he's giving us. Our God of hope won't fail to fill you up with his wonderful riches and blessings and joy and peace as we trust in him and overflow by the power of the Spirit. Our family did not take for granted the many blessings that we had each day. We appreciated being together, treasured the times that we had, and joy, it's not about circumstance. Hardships are going to be temporary, 
especially when we realize there is no heaven on earth. Our kids have grown up with the real expectation to know their needs are met and the rest is fluff. I've shared a bunch of the challenges and how we overcame them. Let me share a glimpse of some of the beautiful blessings our family shared after day after day and year after year in Africa. We cherished family togetherness, admired God's beauty in the tropical flowers and birds and wildlife. We could look out our window sometimes and see monkeys climbing through the trees of our front yard. We shared adventures like bike riding through the bush with zebras right on the side. We'd read books and have shadow puppets during power outages. I took time to bake from scratch. As you can see, I did kind of like donuts. I cooked with the kids. We enjoyed problem solving and praying through many tough times together. Now that we've returned stateside and my husband's a professor at the seminary, I can go shop and cook so much easier. What used to take me three days to prepare for a special meal can take me about three hours. Technology has changed dramatically, supposedly making life so much easier. I'm still fine with paper forms. In fact, I still have some ink left. The first commandment reminds us, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And trusting him means he's going to meet our needs, and that's key. Our biggest need was dealt with on the cross. Mission accomplished when he rose on Easter. The challenges, they point us to our Lord. We run to his word, and we're filled up with his love and grace and purpose. We go because we are his plan to tell the salvation to others. Keeping in mind, I can find contentment and purpose each day. Through the ups, through the downs, through the inconveniences, the outlook that emerges is one of gratitude and faithfulness. I have a purpose. Romans 8.28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. I rest assured I am in the most capable hands of the world, the ones that are used to holding up the entire universe. Mission accomplished through him who gives me that strength. And that allows me to borrow my book title, To Bloom Where God Plants Me. So much of what I have learned is through trials, not happiness. Trials in life are meant to bring us closer to God and can even make for some pretty entertaining stories. I don't buy flower seeds, bring them home, and sit and look at a glossy picture of the seed on the cover. I want to see the bloom. I want to buy a seed packet where I like the bloom. But I can't make the flower bloom. I want to see a plant at fruition, but I can't make that happen. I want to skip that tedious time of slow growth and green stalks, and I want to just jump ahead. But no healthy growth comes if you want to skip that hard time of nurture and sunlight and care. We hope a bloom finally bursts into beauty afterward, which is a true miracle because I can't make anything grow. I simply can't do all things, but he can. He gives the power, the strength, which means I can relocate. I can leave my comfort zone. I can learn to shop and cope with difficulties because I'm counting on him to uphold me and my family in his care with his mighty right hand. I think sometimes our goal shouldn't necessarily to be to get out of all these difficult, hard, and challenging times as to ask, how do I glorify God in the midst of them? Whatever you pay attention to, that's what's going to grow. In life, there are paths we never anticipated we'd go down. Hardships could be health, could be finance, could be marriage or family. Those all can be so challenging to deal with. It's hard seeing the gift in the middle of any struggle. You may never have the opportunity to go around the world and share the good news as a missionary, but in your life might not mean packing a suitcase, but it might be mean being faithful. Whether big or small, might be just in your daily tasks. God asks us to be faithful. He's put you and me at this time and this place in history for a calling for each one of us to share that good news to others. Through everything, God took care of our family, our daily needs, 
and Wells has also graciously cared for us. I want to thank you each personally and for LWMS and the groups that have supported mission work. I want to thank you and say keep on supporting mission work so we can keep on spreading the world, word to the world. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. I reflected on our time in Africa and thought, wow, I really sometimes had a hard time and struggled to find contentment as we did without. But now that we've moved back, I think about it and think, it's really hard to find contentment among so much. For 15 years, I couldn't buy anything heavier than 50 pounds or 28 inches in di diagonal because that was the parameter of a suitcase. Now, I can buy things that are heavier and I can buy things that are big and I realize I need to find contentment. The more God gives us, the more I need to be with him to know how to use it wisely because I can so easily get distracted. Get distracted. Don't think the devil is ever going to let his guard down for you to spend time in the word. We can get so distracted, we may go through our day and not even think it's important to be in the word. When we stray from God's word, we are so unaware how vulnerable we truly are. The impala, the uh, antelope in this picture, wandered that day. It did not get a second chance against that enemy like the lion who is prowling around like a li roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. We know the lion is out there. We've got to be intentional. Now I want to ask, have you ever wondered how a giraffe drinks? I've gotten to see it. It's pretty interesting. They look around, check that the surrounding is safe. They have to contort their long legs. Here's some pictures. And after they get their long legs, then finally their neck can bend down and they can take the long drink that they've been waiting for for refreshment and nourishment. Like the giraffe, we need that daily nourishment and we have got to make the effort. It may take some time and it may take effort, but we need the life, the word where he, God is going to renew his love and forgiveness and peace as we bear his saving name. It's our safe place. Matthew 6, 20, 21 reminds us, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is your mission? What is your calling in life? Is it a hard calling? We often can't control the circumstances around us, but we can control the way we act. We can control what comes spilling out when we know what we're filled up with. Now, we can't look back and grow at the same time. We can look back and see what's happened, but we can only grow in the future. Looking back at the time capsule, I can see change. I can appreciate change. But let me ask you, if you had a, your own time capsule, and you were going to say, I'd like to see a change in a couple weeks, in a couple months, in a couple years. What would you hope for? For me, I trust in God's plan for my life because that shows how big my God is. It's not about me. It's about God's eternal plan and his power in the works. Whatever the calling, God asks us to be faithful. Trusting in God turns any mission from impossible to I'm possible. Read with me the passage from Philippians. And when we get to the word in italics, say it loudly. Or not italics, caps. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. When people look at the challenges in someone else's life and they think, oh, I could never do that. I could never do what they do. You'd be surprised what the Lord can use you to do. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose that prevails. We can see that in, even in our presentation today. We have many plans. We have no idea how the Lord is going to use them to his glory, but I sure trust he can. 
Be what your Savior has gifted you to be. And a reminder to be joyful always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. From 1 Thessalonians. Your mission or calling in life, it may be a challenge. But finish your journey strong and be encouraged. The retirement is out of this world. Mission accomplished. To God be the glory. Thank you.